body has been discovered in the River Thames. Local fisherman Scott Wilkinson has been beaten to death. This has been a very vicious attack on somebody, a very sustained attack. Surrey police open a murder investigation and the entire island is cordoned off. The forensic team must act fast as the clues to catching the killer lie in the crime scene. Every murder seems different, but the goal remains the same, to catch the killer. Help. Hello, I went over to see my friend fishing on Donkey Island this morning. Right, okay. When I got over there, he wasn't there. All his stuff has been moved and there's blood all over his tent. It looks like blood on his tent. Yeah, wait, wait, fix it. Tried the hospital, but I can't get no answers from them. Said he'd been admitted or something. And what's his name? Uh, Scott Wilkinson. And do you know where he could be? Not a clue. He would never leave his fishing stuff unattended. 46-year-old fisherman Scott Wilkinson is reported missing. His campsite on the bank of the River Thames is laden with blood and it's been almost 17 hours since anyone has heard from him. With serious concern for Scott's welfare, police call in the helicopter and fire brigade boat team. Two or three CID officers are in towards the lock keeper's cottage service. Uh, Roger, that's all received, thank you. Donkey Island sits on the River Thames in northwest Surrey. It stretches over 600 metres and is a well-known spot for fishermen. If you can see the fire brigade boat, the tent is about 20 metres towards the southern shore, towards the weir pub. Police believe Scott is injured. It's important they locate him quickly. Okay, three, zero again. Where he's lying in the water, He's in full view of the houses on the northern side of the shore. I wonder if we can get some sort of tarp to uh, shield him from view. The emergency services have discovered Scott's body in the shallow water, hidden amongst some reeds. My supervisor at the scene confirmed they're happy with me to pass the message to family. I would suggest we do let them know, but of course not to discuss the extent of what we found. Yeah, one zero, I concur. Officers break the news to Scott's fiancée, Lisa. Policeman come towards me, and that's when she said, sorry to say, but Scott, is it dead? Broke down. I was going to jump in the water. The death message passed. And for attending unit, please bear in mind that the girlfriend in the garden of the Weir Public House with me. Thankfully, you're on the other side of the island. Scott was a lovely person. People loved him. He was a gentle giant. His smile, his eyes, so kind and nice. He would do anything for anyone. He loved fishing, especially in the summertime. He just felt at peace. I think what hurts more, because we always used to kiss each other goodbye. This time, we just didn't kind of thing but Scott knew I loved him and he loved me. So I don't think we needed to kiss each other to say that. Yeah. November Yankee from November 10. November 10, go ahead. I'm sure you don't need me to say, but at this time, it's a little suspicious. If we're able to keep the body where it is, pending CID, um, planning a forensic recovery, um, let's keep it where it is. With the entire island cordoned off, forensic officers must secure the area around the deceased before they can begin to harvest evidence. Sarah Thurkle has 25 years' experience in crime scene investigation and is one of the UK's leading forensic trainers. Securing an outdoor crime scene is incredibly difficult because there's a high risk of contamination, especially in a scene like this, which is next to the river. There's a lot of leaf cover, there's a lot of dirt. There's a lot of animal activity potentially, which could disturb the scene. The wind could blow and an item might be lost. It could rain and a footprint might be lost. 
there's what we call the golden hour, which in real terms is several hours for a CSI examining a scene. Just try and maximise the amount of evidence you can get from it. Paddy Mayers from the Surrey and Sussex Major Crime Team is leading the investigation. It's a lovely, quiet area. You just wouldn't believe that something so awful could happen in a location like this. There's a great deal of blood and a lot of items with blood on. Blood seeped into holes where rod rests had been. There was quite a bit of blood in the area of his seat, close to the tent and that partly up the tent with some spots going inside. It's very clear to me that it's a very low level attack. The victim was either sitting on the floor or lying down on the floor because the high impact low level blood spatter and a lot of congealed blood that's obviously seeped into the ground around his tent. This has been a very vicious attack on somebody and a very sustained attack. The damage to his skull was horrendous. I've never seen skull fractured like that before or in so many places. A blunt instrument was used to cause those injuries, which could have been a piece of wood. Finding the murder weapon for a crime scene is vitally important because it can link both the offender or offenders to the weapon and also potentially the victim by means of DNA, fingerprints, fibre transfer but then it's like looking for a needle in the haystack. You are looking for pieces of wood with potential blood, human debris on, in a wooded area. They recovered quite a few large pieces of wood, some with nails in. All of those items were sent forensics to see if we could establish that one was a murder weapon. Examining a piece of wood would take several hours under a very good light source. It's very difficult Firstly, to find fingerprints on an item like that, wood is very rough and also very absorbent surface, so it's negating the potential to be able to find fingerprints. I would expect to potentially find blood if it's been used as a weapon. Looking at any obvious damage area or any possible staining on there, blood is very good at providing good DNA profiles. I know some pieces of wood had some nails in them, uh, again, if these have been used, there may well be blood and skin that's been attached to uh, the nails on the wood as they've been used to attack the victim. The CSIs would be looking at other trace evidence that might be found on there. For example, there might be fibres that have been caught in the damaged wood. In addition to that, there may be traces of wood within the head wounds on the victim. If anything's found, then it would be swabbed and sent off for check-in against all known offenders that are on the DNA database. Police have discovered an abandoned campsite secluded by the trees, just metres from where Scott's body was found. There were three tents there, upturned, and there was no one with them, leaving various bits and pieces around. And it was imperative that we found out as quickly as we could who had been staying there. Paddy's team make inquiries at the properties on the opposite bank to the campsites. We quickly established that there had been some other boys staying within scene two. They'd been there for a few days prior to Scott's arrival, but they hadn't been seen since Scott uh, went missing. They could have vital information that could lead us to those responsible. Finding out who these people are and what they know about the murder has become the police force's main priority. Police have recovered 46-year-old Scott Wilkinson's body from the River Thames. He has been murdered. I've never seen skull fractured in so many places. A blunt instrument was, was used to cause uh, those injuries. Several pieces of wood have been sent for forensic analysis. Identifying the murder weapon could be key to catching the killer. Police have discovered an abandoned campsite, just metres from where Scott's body was found. Identifying who has been staying here could be integral to the investigation. Crime scene officers seize various items that may provide DNA profiles. There were toothbrushes within those tents. There were cans, and we would look to have that 
forensically examined at the earliest opportunity. When an offender has DNA taken for the DNA database, the main one that gives really good DNA is the buccal swab. It's actually the cells from inside your cheeks. The forensic officers seized an array of cigarette butts from the crime scene. Cigarette butts are a really good source of DNA, mainly because there's the same cells from the inside of your lips is going on to the cigarette butt. We normally cut the filter paper off the outside and remove the filter from the inside. The filter itself in the cigarette is just full of the contaminants from the tobacco. What we're looking for is the buccal cells that are on the outside of that brown paper. There are a number of drinks cans and some Capri Sun with some straws that were recovered from the scenes. Similar to the cigarettes, you're going to get the buccal cells from inside your lips onto the edge of the straws. If you imagine when you're drinking from a can, you're constantly putting it to your lips. You'll get DNA from sweat from your nose onto that ring pull. And the top of a can has normally got a ridge around it. DNA cells from your lips can get stuck around that ridge and it can remain there for quite a long time. Recovering toothbrushes from the crime scene, there were some in scene two. These are again a really good source of DNA. You're not looking at the saliva, you actually look at the skin cells from inside of the mouth. Toothbrush bristles are normally nylon or viscose and these are very tight-knit fibres. So the DNA will really get embedded within those bristles which means that it's very hard to wash that DNA away. The DNA swabs get fast-tracked through the police database, and the team also tests several items for fingerprints. Smooth, shiny surfaces that are non-porous are really good surfaces for fingerprints. Fingerprints are made up of a majority of sweat and water, and the amino acids within the sweat will actually leave an imprint on the surface. There's a number of powders that we can use on smooth, shiny surfaces. Black powders is a carbon-based powder. You use a squirrel hairbrush, and it gives good contrast on a silver surface. The powder will actually stick to the ridges of the fingerprint and leave gaps in the furrow of the fingerprint impression. Aluminium powder is good on a surface such as a Coke can because firstly there's good contrast with the colours because you're putting a silver powder on a red surface of the Coke can to build up the fingerprint ridge detail on the surface. There's several different lifting tapes that you can use to lift fingerprints depending on the surfaces. But you can use black gel, which is quite good to use on a rough surface or a curved surface because you can mould it round the fingerprint. Smooth surfaces, we normally just use like a JLR tape. Whilst the police await any DNA or fingerprint matches, Paddy has received the full pathologist report. The extent of Scott's injuries suggests there was more than one offender. The amount of injuries on Scott, he had two black eyes, various bruises, marks all over his body. We believe that the motive of Scott's death was, was robbery. Because of the violence that was shown, myself and the team were convinced that they will go on to do something like this again. One of the main priorities had to be safety of the public. And one particular wound could open up a new forensic lead. They had a significant wound to his forearm. That I personally believe that was a defence wound and a knife was used to cause that injury. At the crime scene, Scott's large fishing knife is missing. If we could find the knife, it could assist us uh, forensically. Police can't locate the knife on the island, so call in Peter Falding and his specialist underwater search team. Our job is to get that evidence or somebody potentially could come back in the middle of the night and try and retrieve that evidence. Potentially there's, there's DNA, there's fingerprints on that. Although it's in the water, there's a good way we can recover the evidence from that. The island's riverbed spans more than 600 metres. Peter must rely on his experience to narrow down the search area. When I was carrying out the um, initial sweep, I said, I think this is a great area, because if he's run out of the wood with a weapon, then he's going to throw it. He, we won't want to go far with it. The police tasked us with fingertip, a shallow water search around the edge, and that's in zero visibility generally. You've got to be focused. 
I closed my eyes so I could immerse myself into it. The river search presents many difficulties. More than 200 boats a day pass through here in the summer months. A boat could come along with a long skeg on the bottom and they could literally could ground out and, and drag the evidence away. Around the other side of the island, the water was flowing quick, so any evidence could potentially be washed away. So it was, it was all fastball. It was really, really urgent to get this done. If there is a weapon in the water, the team needs to locate it fast to stand any chance of it providing them with evidence. The longer the knife is in the water, the slimmer the chances. It's a particularly long dive. I was underwater for about 2 hours and 15 minutes, and just feeling along the bottom, and following the line slowly, slowly. I put my hand on something, and then very carefully I could feel a handle, and then I just could feel the blade gently without cutting myself. I remember coming out the water, it was a bit like Excalibur, you know, with you coming out the water with this knife. It was great, yeah, it really is. When you find evidence that you know you're going to potentially get a conviction out of, then that's really exciting for the team because it's a great find, the police are happy, and then they can fast ball and start getting the investigation moving a lot quicker. When the knife was found, it's really positive. You hope that there may be that golden nugget that will link it to your victim and, ideally, a suspect. So on the knife that was recovered, we need to try and find the victim's DNA on the blade, potentially, and then also the offender's DNA and or fingerprints on the handle of the knife. Just because a knife is found in water doesn't mean that we negate any evidence on there. We would still examine it. The chances of finding fingerprints after a knife's been in water is very low. It's not impossible, but it is very low. There are certain areas where some DNA may catch and last longer than other areas. The hilt of the handle is quite a good area where some DNA could get caught and not be washed off. Serrated edge of a knife, again, is really good for potential DNA to be caught in the, in the actual teeth of, of the serration, depending on how serrated it is. The forensic scientists couldn't locate any fingerprints, but send the swabs away hoping for a DNA match to both the victim and an offender. Meanwhile, the test results are back from the samples submitted earlier. We got some really positive information as a result of the forensics from the DNA. Three suspects have been forensically linked to the crime scene. What was interesting was that they, they were known to the police. DNA extracted from the bristles of the blue toothbrush matched to 16-year-old Lenny Crort who has been reported missing from his care home in Lancashire. Samples taken from the other toothbrush also provided a match to Lenny's older brother, Shane Crawt. Fingerprints lifted from the Coke can and the Capri sun pouch matched to a third person of interest, the Crawt's cousin, 21-year-old Charles Smith. All three suspects have a history of offending. It was important that we located them as quickly as we could. As shocking as it was, the fact that they were so young made no difference. We really needed to get to the bottom of if they were responsible or not. Now it was all about getting out there. Let's arrest them. Um, let's see what they've got to say. They'd all gone on the run. We believe that they knew that they were wanted for murder. Charlie Smith was seen walking down the street. They just happened to see him, Smith, trying to, to run away. And lo and behold, he was lifted. Lenny had, had returned to the children's home back in Lancashire, but we quickly managed to find Lenny. Shane was the, the more difficult one. At one point, he actually jumped out of a window to evade capture, and he was lying low for quite a while going round to different family addresses in order to evade capture. But we finally got them. We had them all in custody and they were all interviewed, having been arrested for Scott's murder. This interview is taking place at Guildford Police Station. It's being both audio and also it's been video recorded. So you've got the cameras in the corners. It's a soundproof room. Yeah. The police caution says that you do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something which you later align in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Scott Wilkinson was found murdered on the afternoon 
the Thursday the 28th of July this year. Forensic evidence has linked you to that offence. From six o'clock in the evening onwards, last Wednesday, the 27th of July, tell me where you were, Shane. No comment. What was your location? No comment. Who were you with? No comment. Tell me what happened, Shane. No comment. Lenny, were you in Walton upon Thames on Wednesday the 27th of July? No comment. Have you been there since that time? No comment. It's not a shock when a suspect uh, fails to answer any questions. As investigators and interviewers, we prepare for that. I want to talk about the weapon that was used to assault and kill and murder Scott. Describe that weapon to me. No comment. So we will carry on and ask potentially hundreds of questions. Where did that weapon come from, Shane? No comment. Who used that weapon? No comment. I liken it to the closing of all the doors, because once that door is closed and that topic is covered, then actually they can't really go back on it. We believe that you were at the island with at least two other people, Shane Crought and of Charlie Smith. No comment. Is it true to say that they're family members of your Shane? When families offend together in groups, there's a code of honour. If there's a genetic connection between family members, particularly if they haven't had strong relationships with a caregiver, then there may be um, a, an even stronger connection in looking after one another, both during the commission of crimes, but also after detection. So I believe that it was Lenny, Charlie and yourself who were in that area last week. Is that correct? No, come on. The suspects were in custody for a couple of days. We obtained warrants for further detention um, so as we could question them further. Through those interviews, we're preparing to get to the truth. If they speak to us, we'll, we can then go out and check those accounts. And that certainly happened in relation to Charles Smith. I just want to say one thing, I ain't no murderer, I'm asked the truth. Fisherman Scott Wilkinson has been murdered. Three suspects were linked to the crime scene by their DNA and fingerprints. Forensic scientists have submitted samples taken from potential murder weapons. The police still need more concrete evidence to charge the suspects, who are still refusing to answer questions. And time is running out for Paddy Mayers and his team. happened with Scott after he'd been beaten? No comment. Where did you go? No comment. Where did Charlie go? No comment. And Lenny, where did he go? No comment. And the research indicates that there's a kind of us versus them mentality between young people that commit prolific violence and authorities such as the police. They are family members, they have presumably a close relationship, they want to protect one another and they don't want to implicate one another. And it may be that if they implicate somebody else that was there, they actually implicate themselves being there too. Whilst the detectives continue with their questioning, the lab results from the woods seized from the crime scene are in and it's not good news. They've all come back negative. That doesn't surprise me because there seem to be a number of items within that scene that could have been used as a murder weapon and items that also may well have been discarded. The results from the knife tests are also in. No forensic evidence was found on the knife because it had been in water for a number of days. The victim had a slash wound to the arm. It's a very glancing blow. There wouldn't be as much transfer of DNA onto the blade of the knife as if it, he'd been stabbed multiple times and the whole blade potentially has been inserted into the victim. Brothers Lenny and Shane have given very little away during the interview, but their older cousin Charles has asked his solicitor to read a prepared statement. I remember speaking to a man in his 40s. He said his name was Scott. We were speaking about fishing and the types of fish he was catching. Shane and Lenny were there. Shane put his fishing stuff in his tent then we decided to come back. All the fishing stuff was gone and the tents were turned over. They had been smashed up. 
When we got back, Scott was there, on his own, and said he hadn't seen what had happened as he was asleep. He was helping Shane look for his fishing rods. I was speaking to Scott for a while. He was a really nice guy. He put himself at the scene. He was there. He'd been speaking with Scott. Said he was a really nice chap. About an hour later, I then left. Shane and Lenny, Lenny also left and went in the opposite direction at the same time. I denied causing any harm to Scott and did not witness anyone else causing him any harm. After I left on Tuesday the 26th of July 2016, and um, have not returned to the river. We do appreciate you giving us this, because with all these investigations, particularly a murder investigation... I just want to say one thing, that I ain't no murderer, I'm the truth. OK, do you know who's responsible for this? A comment. There is insufficient evidence to charge the suspects, and the extended custody time limit is up. What the evidence did show us was that the Crawts and Smith had been on the island. They had been conversing with Scott. Unfortunately, the forensics didn't link the offenders to Scott and his murder. At that point, they were released. This is a blow to both the detectives and to Scott's fiancée, Lisa. I couldn't believe it. It was a shock to me when I found out. It's like my whole soul has been ripped apart. Having spent a lot of time with Scott's family, and in particular his mum and dad, it was clear that he was really loved by them, missed by them. He loved his fishing, and I don't think anyone ever believed that he would go fishing and die under these circumstances. I think as a team, want to do the right thing um, and leave no stone unturned for Scott's family, especially mum and dad. But we'd have a photo of Scott up on the briefing screen. Now this is what it's about. It's about getting justice for Scott and doing our best to gather in as much evidence as we possibly could in order to hopefully prove their involvement in Scott's murder. Despite the setback, Paddy and the major crime team are hoping that digital forensics can help them prove who killed Scott. CCTV was going to be key. For such a large island, there is very limited CCTV. Paddy's team sees all the footage from the Weir pub, 50 metres from the crime scene on the opposite bank, and also from the lock gate, over half a kilometre away. This bridge is the only way on and off the island. You can see to my left, you've got the locks and the CCTV cameras that were quite pivotal to the investigation. And if we look over this side of the river, that's the footpath that leads to the Weir Public House. One of the first priorities was to prove or disprove Charles Smith's story. Charles Smith claims that he was in the area on Tuesday, two days before Scott's body was discovered. The team digitally examine his mobile phone history and track his movements to a nearby shop where he last topped up his phone credit. Now they have identified his clothing, they can review the Lockgate CCTV, where he is seen cycling along the towpath towards the footbridge to the island. Officers examine the footage frame by frame to see if they can debunk Smith's claims that he did not return to the island on the Wednesday. Digital specialists analyse every camera angle. The officers that looked at the footage to clock who was walking past or going on and off the island found it extremely difficult. The majority of CCTV is not aimed at looking for offenders and criminals. And in this particular case, the cameras in question, one was covering the lock, so therefore the boat's going up and down to make sure it's safe waterways, and the other camera is for the public house. And in particular, the footage from the lock. It wasn't designed to focus on the bridge to see who's going past, so therefore you're looking at their movement, the mannerisms and other things to corroborate the person, whether it is their clothing and things on their clothing or what they're carrying and what they've got with them. And in this particular case, the positives out of the CCTV for that area is the type of people that frequent the location, the dog walkers, families, the, the Krauts and Charlie Smith on this occasion would stand out compared to everybody else.
they eventually find the evidence thereafter. The footage shows Charles, Lenny and Shane heading onto the island on the Wednesday. They are then captured on camera at a nearby water station filling their bottles, proving Charles Smith's claims that they did not return to the island after Tuesday as false. Scott's fiance was the last person to see him alive. She is seen on the Weir pub security camera heading to the island around 9.30 p.m. As the sun sets, the CCTV footage becomes even more difficult to analyze. We well, you're relying on shapes, colors, lighting as it goes across the bridge. Scott walked Lisa off the bridge around 11 p.m. on the Wednesday evening. This is confirmed by the cluster of bright pixels showing Scott's head torch moving along the bridge. Lisa is then seen heading home on the pub CCTV. That leaves a 10 hour window until Scott was reported missing. Footage from the four cameras is examined frame by frame, a specialist scan for the tiniest of movements. It's a massive task with more than three and a half million frames to view. If you have CCTV cameras that aren't maintained, then the quality is quite poor. You have spiders and you have cobwebs which cause issues and cause also reflections of the light which can be deceiving. You may think he's a person when it's not a person. The amount of hours the officers spent painstakingly for hours on end looking at who was going past, who went on and off the island, was huge. It is proving extremely difficult to confirm if the boys left the island before or after the attack. But Paddy receives some information that provides a significant breakthrough and a first for Surrey police. During the pathologist post-mortem, we established that Scott had a heart rate monitor fitted within his body, and that was as a result of an ongoing medical issue. Scott had a heart condition that could sometimes trigger seizures. He had a heart monitor embedded in his chest so that cardiologists could record data linked to his seizures. It was programmed to store data when Scott's heart rate became erratic. This data would remain on the device for four years. The information was extracted and sent to a specialist analyst in Chicago. The results would provide Paddy with unprecedented evidence. That heart rate monitor told us a massive story. At 23.18 on that Thursday night, Scott's heart rate went up to 122. That's very likely to be the adrenaline rush when he's been attacked. With this key information, Officers time the route from the murder site to the footbridge. We know from walkthroughs that we've done as a team that it takes roughly six minutes to get from scene one up the path to the footbridge. Having this timestamp means the CCTV experts can hone in and super enhance the footage from the footbridge camera in the minutes after the attack occurred. Four minutes later, we have our three suspects leaving the island. Despite this key piece of digital forensic evidence, it is still not enough to prove that the three prime suspects were the killers. With a lack of forensics linking these guys to the murder, we needed to identify anyone with information in relation to the murder. We know from the intelligence that we'd had that they had bragged about what they'd done. The house-to-house -house inquiries were massive. And to be honest, part of it was as well, let's rattle their cages. I wanted them to talk. I wanted them to be worried. And I wanted them to speak with people in the hope they, they would, someone would come to us. By doing the house-to-house -house inquiries is in the hope that we find witnesses. And in this case, um, we had three really important witnesses that were identified. And these were three young lads who were in Grovelands Park on the night of the murder. And they were approached by the Crawts and Smith. I don't know how I'd explain it, probably still high from what they'd done. And they warned these boys, you know, don't be messing with us. We've just killed someone tonight. And they'd even acted out what they'd done to Scott. 
showing how they stamped on him, stamped on his head. And they were laughing and joking. Usually after the event, we would witness feelings of remorse and guilt. What's interesting about young people who inflict really serious fatal violence and then immediately brag to others about it, it's an indication that they may be desensitized to the gravity of the situation. They may start to see violent events as accomplishments or something to brag about or to generate street cred for themselves and a sign of that recognition that they're seeking for having achieved something or accomplished something that they may be in some ways proud of. It's the opposite of what we normally see. The emotions of shame and guilt and remorse are actually completely opposed emotions to things like pride and feeling very positive about one's action. At that point, there was nothing out in the media. Nobody knew that Scott was missing, and we certainly didn't know until 4 o'clock, 4.30, the following afternoon, that Scott had been murdered. That told us that they must have been at the scene at the time, and they'd actually admitted that they had killed the man. I was quite happy that it wouldn't be very long before we would have day of action, which would result in the further arrests of the offenders. As Paddy builds his case, he's handed the most significant piece of evidence to date. Why would they do that? It's a fucking murder thing, isn't it? It's a scumbag, isn't it? scumbag. The secret recording, that was a golden nugget that I would never um, have expected and will probably never happen again. Paddy Mayers and the major crime team are investigating the murder of fisherman Scott Wilkinson in Surrey. After months of intense police work, the most compelling piece of evidence has come to Paddy's attention. The secret recording, we never have imagined that we would ever be provided with such a piece of evidence. An associate of Charles Smith was being investigated for a separate matter. And to the team's surprise, he presented the police with a secret recording of Smith talking about the murder. Why would they do that fucking murder thing, wouldn't they? The scumbag, isn't it? Proper scumbag. And then he was trying to start laying into the man. Then he got the knife, cut the man from there to there. And it's a shame. Well, he had a nail on a stick like that. I don't know what they told you. Really? Nail on a stick like that, beating the man to him with it. It confirmed a lot of the confession evidence that we'd got. You had Charlie Smith saying within the confession on the tape about Lenny Crort slashing Scott with a knife. No one would have known that. It was just that little added extra which would really be positive for a jury to hear. We decided on a, a day of action. Uh, we had the CPS on board with the prosecutor. We decided obviously we wanted to arrest all at the same time, same days. It was a massive event for the team and certainly you know, Scott's, Scott's family. So we knew that Spith was still within the family home, so quite local. What's going on? Go off this, mate. This is my colleague. Why am I being arrested again for this? As a result of the continued investigation into Scott's murder, we now have substantial new evidence that links you to his murder. You do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not I'll mention be, when questioned something which you later rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. All three suspects are re-arrested for Scott's murder. In custody, the police disclosed the witness statements from the boys in the park, who claimed the three suspects bragged about the murder to them. The area I want to concentrate on now is a place called Grovelands Park. Three witnesses, round about midnight of, that, of the same night of the murder, have come forward and given statements in relation to you, Lenny and Charlie, approaching them, and you're starting to talk about what you've just done. And the comment is, we just murdered someone. Who said that? No comment. They describe being feeling intimidated by you three. Was it you who intimidated them? No comment. Shane Court provided no comment to all questions asked to them. Was that you, Shane and Charlie, going to the park and talking about the murder? No comment. As for Lenny Court, likewise, uh, no comment. I'd, I'd say reasonably relaxed. Is that Charlie Smith that was doing most of the talking? No comment. Do you remember that, Charlie? No comment. Was that you who said that? No comment. 
Charles Smith, he was probably the most animated. Do you remember that conversation with those three lads in Grosvenor's Park? No comment. Chap fucking shit, mate. Um, he became quite aggressive um, with the interviewing officers. You're just making fucking shit up, mate. That's what you're doing. Can we stop the interview just for a second, please? Yeah, but they're fucking making shit up, mate. It's fucked up, Charlie. mate. Can we just stop the interview yeah. for, for a few minutes? Yeah, no, no problem at all. I think it showed us that, you know, we, we had him and the others backed into a corner. Police then present the suspects with the secret recording of Charles Smith implicating his cousins, Lenny and Shane, as the killers. This, we say, it's quite clear, details your involvement and others in the murder of Scott Wilkinson. And I'll tell you who the voices are, but you may well recognise them. Why don't they do that? Fucking murder thing. They're scumbags, probably scumbags. Well, I've well, he had a nail on the stick like that. I don't know what they told you. Mm -hmm. A nail on the stick like that. I think the man said he was good. Trust me. Well, that's how Scott Wilkins was a while ago. Well, the man was a lovely man. I got him so well with the man, too. And they fucking done that to him. Oh, no. And then he's the one that's done most of it, aren't he? Yeah. Well, to be honest with you, I wish I did tell the people they'd done that now. Truthfully, he thinks about it now. Oh. That man didn't deserve to die. I'd like to think that they knew at this point, because of the evidence that we had, they would have known at that point that actually we're in trouble. No, you're not just talking, Lenny. No, I'm in. <coughs> I want to speak to. Uh, I forgot his name. Yeah. Um, can I talk to my client? Yes. Yeah. You said that you'd wish you'd told the police what they had done. This is your opportunity, Charlie, to tell me. No comment. He knew that the game was probably over. We know from the intelligence that we'd had, a comment was made by, I think it was the two courts, to say all we need to do is murder one more person and we'll be serial killers. Now they were in serious trouble. At Crown Court, all three suspects plead not guilty. Lenny refused to give evidence. And Shane and Charles blamed each other. After a five-week trial, the verdicts were in. The jury believed Charles Smith was involved, but was not culpable of murder. He was sentenced to 13 years for manslaughter. Both Shane and Lenny Crort were found guilty of murder and sentenced to a minimum of 15 years. I think we were satisfied with the convictions, but really I think we were just pleased for the, for the family. I'll always remember this job. It's one of those jobs, so it was good old fashioned detective work where the team remained committed and worked really hard in order that we get justice for Scott just really positive knowing that those responsible are now locked up and behind bars for many years and knowing that they won't be in a position to harm anyone else for a long time. The rest of my life, ifs, buts, they destroyed my life, they destroyed his family's life and yeah, they're doing time for it. But at the end of the day, it's still not going to bring him back. Who's going to win, Boomer or Lou? The top dog crowns up for grabs as they prepare to do battle in brand new Wentworth. The final sentence next.